let's get started. Okay. So Joanne, is it working? Okay, so um, welcome. This is uh, Computational Genetics. It's a uh, course um, 224, 124 in computer science, human genetics 124, human genetics 224, bioinformatics 224, and there might be some other way to be registered that I'm forgetting, okay? But if you're in none of those, then none of those five, then you're in the wrong class, okay? Um, this, um, this classroom is really weird because um, the projector makes me feel really short, okay? And so the videos are gonna be really funny looking because of that. And then also, there's this really loud noise coming from this, like, I don't know, this like grill that it feels like if I step on it, I'll get sucked in there. Do you guys, does that, can you hear me in the class, in the back? Okay, so let me know other, otherwise. Okay, so um, this is, okay, competition genetics. How many people here uh, took my class in the, uh, was it winter, fall, fall? Okay, a few of you. Okay, um, okay, good. So this class is gonna be a little different in the sense that um, that class had was only chalkboard. This is actually gonna have all slides. Okay, and today what we're gonna be talking about are two things. We're gonna be talking about um, just introductions of the class and the area, and also we're gonna be just I'm gonna get in on some of the material. Um, the here's the the course. Um, requirements. This is basically like the prerequisites. That's you know knowledge of a programming language and a statistics course. Um, we can waive that. You know, just talk to me if you don't have that. I think officially it's like pick 10 C and one of the stats or biostats courses. Um, but there's some flexibility because I know it's hard to get into those classes. Okay. So um, the requirements is that there's going to be um, three short homework assignments, uh, five paper responses. Okay three programming homeworks, the midterm, April 15th, that's really soon, okay? That's actually the sixth class. Um, final exam, final project, and there's gonna be e extra problems and a bigger project for graduate students, but the bulk of, you know, but um, I'll be marked on, on the things. So basically, the, this is the grading basis. Um, so you can see that actually in the midterm and the final, uh, they, they count 20%. Uh, but you can make a lot of points on the other things, and the final project is 30%. So the final project um, is, 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 gives you a lot of credit, and there's a lot of opportunities to actually get extra credit there. Okay, so um, there's a technology ban in the class, okay? So um, this is an experiment that we started, started in fall, and it worked pretty well. So the idea is that uh, no laptops, phones, tablets, um, and, you know, the TA is, is watching you from the back. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and you can request an exemption if you really use it for notes, but um, the reason why I'm putting this in is because last year when I taught this class, um, people were playing, like, a networked, um, like, video game against each other in the class, right? So it's just too out of control, okay? I could, you know, too much. And so I think that, you know, it's, all that stuff is distracting, so I think what's better, a lot of the stuff that we're doing is more mathematical, and I think if you really take notes on paper, it'll be um, good for you, and then retype them in. Um, that's what I would recommend, and you should try it. Probably you guys never have really taken notes on paper. Many of you, I understand, um, but I, I think it's worth trying. The videos are also going to be recorded and posted as well. So um, when you're watching them at home and you want to take notes on your laptops and your phones and stuff like that, or even do Facebook while you're playing my video at home, that's perfectly OK. okay? So but just I think in class, we want to try to avoid that. And if you really need a problem, just send me an email. Um, OK, so the, core, the goal of the course is that we want to train you to be able to do some interdisciplinary computational research. So even though we're focusing on genetics, I understand that you know, most people here aren't going to go on into careers in genetics. So the idea is that this is going to be kind of an example and a mechanism for you to learn skills that you can apply for other, other things. So in general, 
we're going to be le learning a lot about just how to analyze data and how to formulate problems. And so we're going to, I'm going to teach you how to read papers in the field uh, that are new papers, uh, with, but with basically no prior background, and how to get through them. We're going to learn about how to identify computational problems and try to solve them. And we're going to work on trying to formalizing abstract computational problems so that way they, they can be solved. And then and all of most of that is going to be done through an open-ended final project that you'll be that you'll be um, you'll be doing. Um, so the final projects, they're basically these interdisciplinary computational research projects. So they're important biological problems. Um, that you'll identify. You're going to have to formalize it to turn that into an actual computational problem. Then you'll have some kind of an idea on how to solve it. Then you'll evaluate the, how it performs compared to like some other you know, baseline methods and over some benchmarks. And then you'll identify implications. And you'll be basically giving a presentation in class on your project. There'll, there'll be many problems to choose from. And there's different, different difficulty levels for grads and undergrads. Um, so uh, there'll be about 15 available projects. And you'll need to decide on a project by April 24th. Okay? Um, the midterm's on April 15th, so which is early this year. So the projects you can kind of think of will start afterwards. On, on um, a week from Wednesday, I'm going to talk about final projects in class a little bit. But in general, this is, you just have to really uh, think about this. This is going to be after the midterm. Um, okay, so there's going to be uh, four levels of difficulty for the projects. Okay, They're, they go from easy, medium, hard, and very hard. Okay, um, undergrads, in order to get an A in the class, and for me to be very happy with you, you just have to do an easy project. Okay, um, grad students, you have to do at least a medium project. Okay, so you might ask. You know, why do we even have hard and very hard projects? Okay, that's mostly because if you want me to actually respect you, okay, <laughs> um, you better do either a hard or very hard project. Okay, um, but not only that. Obviously, I realize that that's not going to be motivation. But um, if you do a harder project, you can increase your grade. So up until about almost two halves of a grade. So if you you know, the same grade, but you do very hard project, you'll, you'll get a boost, OK? Um, and there's no group projects allowed, OK? Um, this is because my experience has been that in groups, um, there's two reasons why there are no group projects. One is, is that, come on, let's be honest, right? You guys know how group projects work, right? One person does it, and then, you know, you guys split it up among your different classes. That's true. The other thing is, is that, you know, since we're, we're grading all the projects, and everyone's presenting it. You see sometimes when there's like an individual person does a much better job than a group, then it makes the group look bad. You know? So in general, we found that like group projects, it just doesn't work. So everyone has an individual project. You can talk to other people about your project and things like that. That's fine, right? Um, but everyone's responsible for their own project. OK. Um, so the. Paper, so another thing that we're going to be reading is we're going to be reading paper. So I'm going to be giving you a paper about, so there's five papers you're going to read. They're going to be about every, so every other week you're going to have a paper. Okay. Um, the first week, though, um, typically the, the, the questions are due on, when, on uh, Mondays. Okay. So you'll have the, the paper to read for a week. And then that following Monday, you have to post on the web board, uh, uh, one question. Okay, this could be about you know any question about the paper. This doesn't have to be a question that is like so difficult that no one else can answer. It can actually be a legitimate question. Okay, and then by the following Wednesday, you have to reply to two other people's questions. Okay, so um, you'll see how this works. But um, and then and then you get credit based on if you do that. So. That if there's five papers, you know, there's going to be this you know, certain number of response. This week, um, I'm actually giving you two videos to read, to, to, to watch, okay? And the questions are going to be due on Wednesday and Friday. So the questions on Wednesday and the responses on Friday, okay? So I know that's not a lot of time, but it's like watching two hours of television. Um, I'm sure you guys can make time, okay, by Wednesday. 
Um, so here's the first uh, video. It's by this guy named Eric Lander. He's a really, really, really famous um, kind of geneticist. And he has a really, he, want this, he wants some award. He talks about um, genet genetics. This is the, the URL. Uh, by the way, the slides are all posted on uh, CCLE, and soon they'll be posted on our class website as well. Um, but you can just you can download the link from the slides. You don't have to write that down. Um, that's one video. And then the second video is this Nova, okay, from uh, March 2012, and it's called Cracking Your Genetic Code. Okay, it's like a one-hour thing. It's like a great um, documentary type thing about exactly the kinds of things that we, we, we focus on. So any questions on this so far? Let's do, yeah. Um, so I used to say midnight, okay, but then that introduced ambiguities if I meant Midnight with like this midnight whatever. So I say eleven fifty nine p.m. Okay, yeah. Okay, but you'll see. Actually, you'll see. There's a there is major incentive to do it much earlier. Okay, because when you're asking the first question, it can really be anything, right? For example, what is DNA, right? <laughs> but you know, if you don't. Re re do that question right away, someone else is going to get there with that question so you can't do it, right? And then the, similarly, responding, if someone says, what is DNA, that's like the one you want to respond to right away, right? But otherwise, otherwise you can get into only the hard ones left and then you're, yeah, you'll see obviously around um, 10, 45 to midnight, there's like a massive activities, right? So as, as expected, okay? So any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can, as soon as posted, you can respond, you know? Yeah. So I'm guessing we should try to avoid answering questions that have already been. No, no, you can see that there's like this whole discussion, you know? I disagree, or you don't know what you're talking about, or like according to Wikipedia that this is not correct. There's like a, lots of opportunity, yeah. So, yeah, you can say anything you want. By the way, um, I um, am committed, okay, not to hold any idiotic thing you say on the web board against you, okay? So I, I will not, no matter how ridiculous or incorrect your response is, I will never take it into account for your grade if I ever write you a letter of recommendation, and the web board will be closed, you know, to the public, okay? So you, you feel free to, to re reply whatever you want, you know, conjecture, whatever. Just don't say anything that would get me in trouble, but outside of that that'd be fine yeah any more questions on that okay so uh, okay so these two this will be kind of interesting um, they're I think they're good they'll be interesting to get you kind of motivated for the class um, a couple um, options so this I'm gonna now talk about many of you how many people here are in the bioinformatics program okay and how many guys here are in CS and how many people in engineering not CS okay so if so I'm just gonna announce some of these things. So if you are CS, uh, there's the SciTech electives, okay, that you can utilize to give you credit for a bunch of the bioinformatics classes towards your major, okay? It's on the website, you can look it up. Similarly, if you're in engineering, there's this called technical breadth area and genomics, which instead of, you guys all take like that, what is it, engineering management? Is that the one that most people take? Yeah, yeah, so if you don't take that, you can take some of these classes instead, and then they, they can they count towards degree. Okay, so there's uh, information on the website, and also uh, if you ask the advisors, they know all about this. Um, and so there's uh, so this is actually I mostly put this into the uh, just so it's in the slides. the The reason why we created this is because in a lot of the biology courses at UCLA have all these prereqs that you have to take, like chemistry and stuff like that. So this way. The SciTech and Technical Breath Area lets you take some of these and get credit for it for your major. Okay? Um, and so this is more details. Okay, so this is the list of the courses, et cetera. Okay? So the other thing is, for many of you know that there's a minor here. Um, many of you are in the minor. For those of you that aren't, it's actually pretty well integrated with computer science, so it's not so hard to also add it to your program. Um, there's, uh, the, this is the structure of the minor. So there's a seminar class 
called um, uh, CS184 or CM184. How many people here took 184? Okay, yeah. Easiest two units you will ever take, okay? R highly recommend it. Uh, but you'll learn a lot of the different areas in the field. Um, so these are the core classes. You're in this one right now. Um, I teach this one in fall. Actually, next year I'm teaching in winter if you haven't taken it. And then this is also another good one. It's going to be fall. So next year there's going to be three of these core classes that you can take. Um, if you fail my class, you can retake it in spring as well. Um, there's also, you have to take algorithms, and then there's electives as well. And so uh, some details. Okay, and this is what you have to take for the lower divisions. Um, I'm, all, of you, all of you are here, you probably took it, right? This is kind of a difficult one to take if you're a CS major, but if you look at some of the earlier slides, that's how you can fit it in there. Okay, so are there any, um, and so, uh, yeah, and these are the electives. Okay, and then this is that 184 class. Okay, and this is a course plan. I just put it solid. Also, it's here. Okay, so any questions on any administrative aspect of the course before we get into uh, content? Or, yes? Huh? No, so we're not podcasting it um, like through the university, but uh, Joanne, who's the TA, uh, that's Joanne, by the way, she's the TA, yeah. Um, and actually, we have two TAs. Uh, Dat, he's still on spring break. Um, he'll be back on Wednesday and leading discussion on Friday. Um, Joanne, uh, there, we're just video with our own camera, okay? And then we'll post the videos on, uh, on the website. So you, you'll have access to them, okay? Yeah. Um, can you explain how instructions work? Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is actually based on feedback from last quarter, okay? Um, what we found is that People don't always, so discussions are for, mostly for the undergraduates, so graduate students don't have to go to discussion at all, okay? There's going to be only one discussion that the grad students have to go to, which is going to be a special one, and I forget exactly the date, uh, but I'll announce it, which is when we're going to go over how to do the presentations, okay? But the other ones you don't have to go to at all. Um, undergrads obviously have to go to discussions, but there's two of them, and what we found was that um, they're also like 12 to 2 and 2 to 4, okay? We found that almost everybody went to 12 to 2 and almost nobody went to from 2 to 4, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to split the discussion into two ways. We're going to have 12 to 2 be like what we think of the normal discussion. Um, we're also going to videotape it for anybody who has, happens to have a conflict, okay? And then 2 to 4, we're instead going to be covering like other materials, which is optional, but it's going to be more like hands-on, practical, how to use the tools and things like that. So it'll just, it'll kind of give you a better, it's not really mandatory information, but it'll give you um, a lot of background and might, you might find it interesting. And we'll video that as well. So you don't actually have to go for four hours, uh, but that'll be on the website. So if you have some reason why that's not going to work for you, uh, talk to me and we'll make some arrangements. But I think it's just a, um, a better use of the time because they're probably not, you know, I know how, how many of you guys here honestly don't go to discussion? So you don't admit it, right? But because there's a video camera in the back, right? Yeah, yeah, right. But I, you know, the statistics show that only about half of you will show up to any given discussion, right? So, um, but so if you do, does that make any more questions on that? So, okay. Any question on the class in general? You're all set? Okay, so, okay, so, so let's start. So this is uh, lecture one, um, and I'm going to give an introduction to computational genetics. Okay. Um, by the way, all the slides are already posted, so you can just download them uh, from the website. Okay, so this is the introduction to computational genetics. Uh, what I want to do here is I want to give you guys a overview of the field to try to get you excited about it and to try to give you an idea of what's going on so you have some motivation for what you're going to learn. Okay, so what we're, how many people have seen this movie? Yeah, okay, wow. Um, great movie, really recommend it. This is a uh, movie about um, in a future world where people can predict your traits based on genetics 
how your whole life is pre-planned for you, and that's one aspect. The other thing is that they make these babies where they kind of find optimal combinations of the parents to give these babies, right? And, um, and then, obviously, it's a movie, so there's kind of this uh, love triangle also going on there, which is entertaining, not really related to the class. Um, but I really recommend um, seeing this movie. And essentially, what we're trying to do in the class is to enable this kind of technologies. We want to relate someone's genetics to basically, uh, you know, to traits and disease. We want to predict these traits. Um, OK, so just because of um, I was like looking at, you know, to motivate the class, I wanted to find some recent examples in the press where people are talking about um, this whole area and what we possibly can do in some recent news articles. Okay? And this is what I found. Okay? I found uh, genes drive our coffee habits, study fine. You know? so, um, so like I love this line, are we wired to get wired, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, this is one study in the news, right? Uh, in LA Times, right? This respectable paper, right? Here's a uh, diet personalized so genetic makeups are more effective. Okay, that's also in the news. Um, and then my personal favorite, um, you could be <laughs> genetically predisposed to single, right? Yeah, yeah. So I like the single forever, it's in your genes, yeah. <laughs> Um, so interesting, right? Yeah, yeah, um, maybe. Okay, so we'll we'll look at this, right? So, so obviously they're reporting on some studies. So what are the, so what is this talking about? So um, here's actually to give some context of what's going on in the field. So I would say that starting in about 2000, there's something called uh, the genetic revolution. Okay, so what is the genetic revolution? The genetic revolution is when they really uh, sequence the human genome. So the, what is the human genome? So human genome is, you can think of it, it's, it's the contents of our DNA. It's a, about three, le, three billion length sequence. Um, it's got, um, you know, about 10 million positions that differ between us. And uh, two individuals differ by about 0.1%. And there's about, a, a, you know, the typical technologies measure about a million positions per person. And so there's this new technology that was developed and, it, and, and it's kind of really transformed the field and has a huge impacts, impact on gene, genetics of disease, personalized medicine, cancer, population genetics. We'll talk about all of these things. But this all really started about, I would say, 10 years ago uh, when, when, um, when, when, they started, when these technologies started becoming available. So here's actually a really simple um, introduction to human genetics. Okay. So we have uh, mothers and fathers, and they make children, okay? And when they, they pass on genetic information to their children. So you can see that these, the, each of these things are chromosomes, okay? There's like, here I'm picking, drawing two of them. And you can see that there's essentially two, each chromosome, there's two copies of the, of the chromosome, okay? And what gets passed on to the child is randomly one of these chromosomes gets selected. Like, so for example, here you have, I guess, a light green and a dark green. Is that dark green, right, chromosome? So you have a light green and a dark green chromosome, and randomly the child inherited the light green. Okay? But just as, you know, 50-50 chance it could have gone the other one. Okay? So that's what happened. So, so children each get half of their DNA from the parents, so the parents randomly pass on parts. So if you had a sibling, you can imagine it could have gone different. But on average, you know, each child is, has half the DNA of their parents, and any two siblings have about half of the DNA of each other. So, um, and the question is that if the mother has a disease, the child also is much at a higher risk for disease. And why is that the case? The, the reason that's the case is that there's these risk factors, okay, which are genetic variants that increase your chance of having the disease that are you know, prevalent you know, throughout the genome. And you can imagine that if the mother had the disease, right, she probably had a lot of risk factors for that disease. And since she passed on half of those risk factors to the child, the child's also more likely to have disease. So this is actually why um, people take a family history, for example, when you go to the doctor for the same reason. So the, the key question is um, that people are interested in is you know, how genetic is a trait, OK? Uh, like how many risk factors are there, and how much do they account for the, the trait? 
Um, how does genetics influence the trait? And then finally, you know, should you get tested, right? Does it make sense for you to actually go and check these things, right? And so that's kind of what we, we're going to talk about. So if we, if we look at uh, how can we, t this first question actually people have been answering for a long time. And what people did is they looked at twins. Okay, so if you have, so there's really two kinds of twins. Okay, does this sound, there's maternal and paternal, right? So maternal are called identical twins, okay? And paternal are called, um, I don't know, non-identical twins, right? Or, or paternal twins, right? Um, the, these are called uh, monozygotic and dizygotic twins, okay? So the difference is, is that paternal twins are basically like siblings, okay? And maternal twins are 100% identical. So uh, maternal twins will share 100% of their DNA. Paternal twins, on average, will share 50%. And unrelated individuals maybe will share about 2%, okay? So then the question is, is that if you look at uh, twins, right, you can, so for example, here's some examples, right, of twins, okay? Um, or twins and unrelated, okay? So if you look at, um, if you, so, so you, what you can do is you can take a trait, you can collect lots of pairs of twins and related or unrelated individuals, and what you could do is you can, uh, you can look at some, the following measure it. So you want to measure if someone has a disease, okay, what's the probability that their twin has the disease, okay? That's called concordance. So what you do is you take a bunch of individuals that have, let's say, diabetes, for example, right, and that have twins, and if one of them has diabetes, you say, what's the probability of the other one? So for example, with diabetes, if your identical twin has diabetes, your rate of diabetes is 34%, okay? If, you're, if you've got a paternal twin you, that has diabetes, your rate is like 16%, okay? And this is, if you're, you know, obviously an unrelated person, this is just, has, if someone unrelated to you has diabetes, your chance of having diabetes is the same as just the chance in the population, which is 8%, okay? So the difference between these three numbers kind of lets you compute how genetic is something, okay? So obviously, if there's a big separation between these two numbers, then it's genetic. What if all, all of these numbers were the same? What would that tell you? It's not genetic, right? Right. Does that make sense? Um, so schizophrenia, for example, also very genetic. Okay. Uh, your chance is one percent of the population, but forty percent if you have an identical twin. Right. Uh, that has it, and like a disease like Tay Sachs is like, if you've got an identical twin, it's virtually hundred percent, and you know if you if you don't, your chance of getting it otherwise is almost zero. Okay. So so we're actually going to learn in this class how how they come up with the, these how they actually can measure the genetics, okay? So, th so then there's two kinds of uh, disease, okay? There's what people call uh, Mendelian diseases. So these are very rare diseases. You might have heard about some of these. So um, Tay-Sachs, cystic fibrosis, riley Day. have you heard about cystic fibrosis, these kind of diseases, right? So these are called extremely rare uh, diseases, okay? There's typically a single gene with a large effect. A lot of these were discovered in the 80s using families. Um, this is how things work with them. So each individual has one of three states. Do you guys remember this from bio, like high school bio, right? You either have the disease, which means that you're affected, um, you're unaffected, right? Or you're a carrier, right? And if you have two people who are carriers, like these are two carriers, when they have kids, you know, 25% of them will basically both get the carrier mutations and have the disease, and otherwise they won't. And so this is, this is called recessive. There's also dominant. Does that sound familiar a little bit? Okay, so that's, that's, that's one kind of disease. We're actually not gonna talk about this, this kind of a genetic disease that often. Instead, um, instead we're gonna be talking about uh, what are called complex diseases. And those are diseases that um, are affected by greater than 10%. Um, you know, and there's many genes with small effects, for example, diabetes, uh, depression, heart disease. And so the, the search for these diseases, people apply the same techniques that they try to find those Mendelian ones, 
in the 90s and they failed. They actually found nothing. They, they actually uh, wasted lots of time and money with no success. Um, but recently, and, you know, but recently uh, they found a lot of things and I'll talk, talk to you that. So here's actually how kind of complex diseases work. So basically in complex diseases you have all these genetic factors. Maybe let's say this is in diabetes. These are all genes that affect diabetes. Okay? And you know, you're going to have some of the variants in each of these genes that increase or decrease your risk. And also, there's environmental factors, okay, like uh, diet, exercise, pollution, luck. You know, luck is very important. Um, and so, for example, this is kind of how it works. So, for example, let's say you have these, these guys, but not these two variants, okay? You can think of it like you get a score. Oh, yeah, okay, well, well, we'll talk about that. And then let's say for your, for, for your uh, environmental factors, um, for diet, you eat cake, okay? which is not good. Um, exercise, you only do yoga, okay? Which I think is also not, not real exercise, but that's uh, fine. Um, pollution, you live in LA, that's like okay, not great. And let's say you're not very lucky, okay? So each of these factors, and you can think of you get points for each of these factors. And we'll talk about how we actually can compute these things later, but let's say this uh, variant having it, you know, kind of gives you two points, this one gives you minus three, you don't have this variant, so you get a zero here. This one gives you plus seven, plus eight, and then zero. And so your genetic total is, is um, 63, okay? And similarly, this is what your environmental total. So cake is really bad. Yoga is not great for you. Living in LA is not perfect, but not that bad. Um, being unlucky is this, and your environmental total is this. And if you sum these two together, Let's say if you have a score over 100, then you have diabetes. Okay, that's how it works. So you can see that there's no one factor that, ha that plays a role, but it's kind of a combination of many factors. Um, and so we'll be learning about how to model this and these kind of things. Um, so these are called the, the complex diseases. And this is actually a measure of how much we know uh, in these complex diseases. This is actually a slide from a few years ago. So if you look, these are four diseases, Alzheimer's, breast cancer, diabetes, and, and obesity. And the green bar is the average in the population, okay? The blue bar is the following scenario. If you take every single variant that's been discovered that causes the disease, and you basically lost the genetic gene pool lottery, okay? And you have every variant that increases your risk of diabetes, right? This is the highest your risk could be, for example, or Alzheimer's disease. Um, and the red bar is similarly, on the other hand, let's say you won the gene pool lottery and you got every variant that protects you from diabetes. This is what your, your, your Alzheimer's disease, this is what your risk would be for each of these, okay? And so you can imagine that the separation, be, and this, you're only looking at the two extremes, the maximum and the minimum, right? Obviously there's a, a lot of people in between. But the separation between the red and the blue from the green gives you a lot of information. Okay, you can imagine that, what if all three bars were exactly at the same place? What would that tell you? Yeah, like you don't, you, genes might have an influence, but you don't know what they are. You don't, you don't know, like, clearly you have no information, right? So the fact that, so this separation kind of lets you quantify how much we know. Okay, we'll actually talk a little bit more detail, but what, what, what also, what about Alzheimer's disease? It looks like you know, you know a lot about what causes Alzheimer's disease, right? Because look at how high this is. This is like, you know, close, close to almost 70%. And what about if you have all the ones that protect you from Alzheimer's disease, right? It's not that big of a difference. Like particularly in diabetes, right? It, you might know things that can increase your risk, okay? But even if you have all the ones that decrease your risk, you still have pretty high risk. There's not that big of a difference, right? You guys see that, right? So you can get some insights here, and um, and, and and like you know, this is so this gives you an idea of what, what's going. So this is what, what we found from the studies, and um, so there's also a couple exceptions to this rule, which is that um, there's occasionally like people have heard about this BRCA mutation. Have people heard about that in cancer? Like, uh, like ovar breast cancer and ovarian cancer. People heard of BRCA, okay. 
that's a that's one of the very rare uh, it's actually a variant that's not that rare in the population that actually accounts for a substantial amount of risk for the disease so that's like but for a complex disease like cancer there's there's very few of those Alzheimer has this uh, apoa um, four gene okay actually that's to be AP uh, OE4 gene, which um, increases your risks substantially. Uh, and then um, autism has many, many variants with, um, with uh, large effects. So that, those are the exceptions to the rule. Okay, and so how do we find these variants? So, well, we, we um, in general, what they, they use is they uh, actually use a, actually, before I get there, um, how would you try to find these variants before we get there? If you're trying to find these the variants of all disease, any ideas? Okay. Yeah. So w exactly. Okay. So the idea is that you just take large numbers of people. Okay. Uh, you take two populations. One are called cases. These are individuals that have the disease, and then one are called controls. Is the background population. And then you look at differences within a gene that account for um, the evidence that that one, one gene, if there's a differences, let's say there's a variant that's much more common in individuals that have the disease versus the ones that don't, that variant might be involved in, in the disease. So that's the basic idea, okay? Um, here's actually kind of an example of that. So if I, if I take, these are, let's say these are chromosomes of individuals, okay? Um, these are called cases, people that have disease. Controls, these are people that don't have the disease. Um, okay, what am I looking for? Do you guys see? Is there a, so first of all, what about these, these black positions? They're all the same for everyone. Can they be responsible for the difference? No, right? Because they're the same in, in all of them. I mean, they might actually be doing something important, right? But they can't explain why some of these people have the disease and some don't because they're the same, right? So can you guys see here where there's a variant that's associated? Uh huh. The which one? This this one? Yeah. Okay. This one. Yeah. So that one, right? Okay. So you see, almost all the individuals that have the disease have a G, and almost all the individuals that don't have the disease have a T. Okay. So that suggests that maybe this G is somehow involved in the disease, okay? If these individuals are all equal, okay? Um, is it definitely involved in the disease? Like in this case, why not? Huh? Oh yeah, yeah, so there's someone here, right? So it's certainly it's not 100%. Okay, certainly it's not 100%. But that does, but even still, that, that maybe this has, uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, so that, for example, just by chance, okay, you could have picked out a bunch of, like, you can have no effect, but just by chance, you picked out a bunch of guys that have a G here, right? And a bunch of guys that have a T here, right? Um, because you, how many individuals do you have? You have a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. Eight's not a lot, right? Okay, so that's actually what we're going to be talking about today, which is how you actually determine whether it's, it's significant or not. Okay, so have people hypothesis testing, statistics, you guys learn a lot? Okay, we're going, to, we're going to be covering a lot of that today. Okay, so that's the idea. So, but let me, so, so, so they did this process and they found these variants. So this is, just gives you an idea of actually how many publications they've had looking for these vari variants, okay? So you can see that in 2005, okay, literally zero, okay? And then this is just the cumulative number of papers, right? So now there's 1,960 publications reporting variants, okay? That's a huge number. Um, and you can see it's all happened very recently uh, in the last you know, few years. Uh, this is what it looked like, I think, this is a, a schematic of what was known in 2009. So actually, does anyone know what this, what are the vertical bars here? 
Huh? Chromosomes. Yeah, yeah. These are these are the human chromosomes. Do you know how many there are? Huh? Forty? Uh huh? Twenty-six. I heard twenty-three, twenty-six, forty, forty-six. Um, so there's, yeah, about twenty-three. Okay, twenty-three is the reasonable number. This is um, you actually have two copies of them, so it's really forty-six, right? If you're um, male, then the two X and Y, they're different, so then you can say maybe 24. So I would say 23, 24, or 46 are all correct answers, okay? But typically they just draw the 20, 24, actually. So each of these vertical lines is a chromosome, and it's actually these bands kind of are positioned on them. And each of these colored dots is a, uh, sig signifies that they found a variant at that position that actually color-coded by affects a certain type of disease. So this is 2009, just to give you an idea of how quickly things change. This is 2010, so they found a lot between 2009 and 2010. This is 2012, okay, I found more. Um, I think this is 2013, even more. Yeah, and so obviously they haven't updated for 2014, but you can just imagine that like these are, th these are getting all the stuff, right? So they have, um, okay, so, so th there's a lot known now. So the question is, um, you know, what, what is it that, uh, you know, how can we use this information? And we'll be talking about actually making models for this and, and using this. Um, so the, the question is, is that, you know, like when you're doing genetic testing, um, when is this useful? So people are very, have, have had a lot of success in what are called rare genetic diseases. So these are called, you know, uh, rare diseases, uh, carrier testing, this bracket testing, there's a lot of success there. So the question is, is that, you know, what about this um, common diseases, okay? So let's now go back to, to those traits and see actually what, um, you know, what they tell, tell us from what we just now know. Okay, so here's the, the, the genes that drive our coffee habits, okay? So I was really curious about this, and um, I wanted to know, like, do people really like, is this a real study, okay? Um, why would people, why would, these studies are, are like, are really expensive and uh, a lot of effort. I was like, who really cares about coffee, okay? Um, it actually turns out that scientists really do care about coffee, okay? Um, this, they actually had a heart disease study, which had like 100,000 people, and they asked people how much coffee they drank, like every day, because I guess that affects your heart disease, right? So then they actually reanalyzed their genetic data with coffee, and this is what they found. This is, they found all these genes that affect your co number of coffee cups per day, okay? And so you can see the biggest effect is this one. If you have this one, you have a negative 0.14 cups per day, okay? And then this is the biggest positive. This increases your, by 0 0.07. So if you, if you take all the ones that um, are negative, the lowest effect would be 0 0.32 reduction in the amount of coffee you drink based on your genetics. Okay? If you take the maximum, it's uh, 0 0.25. So you drink a quarter of a cup more. Okay? So I have a question. How many people here drink coffee? Okay. How many people drink one cup a day? How many? Two, um, three, oh, you guys are, four, okay, more than four, nobody, okay, well, okay, anyway, the point is, is that um, if you were going to, this effect, okay, is much smaller than even the range in this classroom, right, so even if your genetics actually did affect it, right, doesn't give you that much information. So that's like the kind of what happens with these these common diseases. Okay, so um, so this is kind of a review of this. So we know that almost everything is genetic. We know that from the twins. Uh, we know that for rare diseases, you know, there's genetic testing is is very reasonable. And then we know for common diseases, they found lots of uh, new genes. They have small effects. Uh, genetic testing is in the er in the early stages. Okay, and so um, how can we take this and Look, like if I give you, 
if you go home today and you look up personalized genetics and you found new articles, how can you know if something is true? And so we'll actually cover this. Uh, we'll learn this and be able to fix that ourselves. But for the meantime, these are kind of um, rules of thumb. Okay, so if you, in a true study, if it's looking at common diseases, it'll have more than at least 2,000 individuals. And it'll report a very small effect and it'll be replicated. So for example, this is that coffee study. So they had 120,000 individuals, okay? So is that a lot? Is that more than 2,000? Yeah, okay, very good. Um, the maximum effect is 0.14 cups per day. Is that small? That's yeah, very small. And they actually did replicate it. They actually did the study twice, okay? And they found the same effect. Um, uh, this single forever, okay? Um, only 600 individuals, right? Is that a lot of people? No, right? And then you're, if you have this variant, you're 20% more likely to be single. Is that like a small effect? That's substantial, right? Yeah, so clearly, yeah, so clearly, sadly, this one is not true. Um, okay. Uh, and then this one here also, they found 138 individuals and they found, found a 400 milligram a day change in sodium intake. Is that likely to be true? Yeah, no, it's not, because it's not enough individuals. So actually, it turns out that this is not really, this study is true, but they're not really saying that it's, all the journalists that read it, misread it. What they really did is, this is kind of interesting, what they did is they took 138 individuals and they told some of them that your genetics make you really bad at um, like absorbing salt. And they told the other people that your genetics is fine, okay? And they found that the people that they told that they're bad at absorbing salt, they got really scared and stopped eating salt, okay? <laughs> so, so this is actually an interesting study that tells you that, that even independent of whether or not the information is accurate, you can actually affect people's behavior based on what you tell them, okay. So, um, okay, so where, okay, so those are like silly examples. What's more realistic? So what are, people are interested in, in is what's called personalized medicine. In personalized medicine, um, you can think of uh, you can think of it like a, someone has a symptoms. You want to give them a treatment. There's really four possible outcomes for those treatment. Either the treatment can be toxic or not toxic, okay, um, and also it can either be effective or not effective. Currently, we just basically give people based on the symptoms or the diagnosis, but and we just hope for the best that it's not toxic and effective. The idea with personalized uh, medicine is that you can differentiate between these different groups, okay? And maybe you can measure something that can say, oh, in this, in this uh, individual, it will not be toxic or it will be toxic. So you could basically give your, your um, uh, decisions on that. Um, here's actually an example. This drug actually is not that used anymore, but warfarin uh, is an anticoagulant, okay? It's, uh, if you have... Uh, uh, like atrial fibrillation, or if you have like some, if you're at risk for having uh, blood clots and strokes, if you're at risk of having, if you have blood clots, you might have, a, if you're at risk of having blood clots, you're at risk for having a stroke. And so what people do is they give, doctors, they give you this um, drug that essentially thins out your blood. Aspirin is also used for this as well. And this is a drug that's very effective uh, for it. It's called warfarin. Um, it's actually not being given that much anymore, but uh, it's it's actually an interesting story. It is a, originally was a rat poison, okay? And I think, I don't know if this is true or not, but there's a guy who, this might be an urban legend, he tried to kill himself by um, taking the rat poison and um, he survived, he took like massive amount of it and he, he survived and they noticed that his blood was kind of thin, okay? And so then that's how they come up with this drug. Um, the interesting thing about that, the reason why he survived is most likely he, there are these genetic variants that you can have. If you have them, you can, um, you can have absorb a lot higher dose of that drug before it has an effect. So he probably had these variants, and that's why he survived. Um, and the optimal dose really varies across the, the population. So in general, what people do then is they, um, like if you have, if you have, blood clots, they'll keep on increasing your dose until you start to have problems, okay? You can imagine that's really problematic. If they give you too high of a dose, you pass out. 
they give you too low of a dose, then, then you're not actually getting the benefits of the drug. Um, but because of the genetic variants, there's this, this uh, website called warfarindosing.org, right, where you type in a bunch of your body weight, et cetera, and then you give them the genetic variants for these, for these mutations. You click this button, and then it'll tell you the dose. So it's an example of kind of a personalized uh, medicine treatment, okay? And so, again, like, why are we talking about this now? So the key ingredients was, one, there's like the Human Genome Project that, that gave us at least where all the genes and all the, gen the DNA of human is, um, identify all the genes, what do these genes do? And then I would say that that was in about 2000. In 2005, um, they figured out um, what all the variation is in the population. So they, they, they collected 270 individuals. Um, and they, this, after they did the HapMap project, they were able to figure out how can you do a study to look for these genetic variants. And what they found was that you need about collect about half a million genetic variants and 4,000 4, individuals. Um, then there's this other key ingredient, which is that around the same time, a couple companies came up with a technology that lets you measure about 500,000 to a million variants for relatively cost ineffective. So it used to cost 14 cents per genotype. Now it's 0.02 cents or even 0.002 cents. So that's a big difference. And so the HabMap originally cost uh, like $100 million. And now it costs like $20,000 or even less. Um, and so associated studies now cost in the low millions. Um, so that's another key ingredient. So once that was available, people were able to do these studies. Finally, there's this new thing, which is that um, there's these sequencing technologies. And so um, probably how many people have heard about next generation sequencing? How many people have not? OK, yes. It's a mixed class. So we'll talk a lot about this. Um, my class in winter covers a lot more of this as well, um, the one that was, I taught in the fall. So there's a use to, the original human genome project cost $3 billion just to sequence one person. Okay? The newer pro technology can do basically one person in about $1,000, $2,000. So it's a huge, huge, huge <coughs> decrease. And it's only about 10 years, 15 years since that time. Um, and so there's many projects leveraging this. So this is actually a, a plot. This is from 2010. So this is already a while ago. Okay? This is a plot of, of uh, how long, how much it costs to sequence 1 million, this is the dollars per million positions of DNA, okay? Bases and positions, you can think of those as independent, okay? So this is on the log scale. Um, you can see that this is dropping really fast on the log scale, okay? This is where the Human Genome Project cost, about 3 billion, okay? And then this is about, um, uh, this, is, this is what it's today. This here is, what is, what is this here? Moore's Law. Okay, what is Moore's Law? Or can I say what is Moore's Law? Huh? Every what? Every 18 months or something like that, right? So it's not what it is, or, right? For the same price, right? Some, for the same price. So you can see what's, go, what's the relation between the sequencing price versus the Moore's Law. Huh? So sequencing is getting a lot, what, cheaper, right? So this is actually, um, if any of you guys are a little bit involved in, um, in let's say, like at UCLA, there's a lot of bioinformatics research, a lot of analyzing sequence data. You know, the first thing you, you notice is that the, um, any of these projects involve huge amounts of data and it takes forever to analyze them. And the reason, and this is just getting worse and worse. And you can think of this graph as really explaining what, what the problem is and why um, being a computer scientist, you're in a really good position to actually address these issues. And the reason is, is that, let's say you're spending the same amount of money on collecting genetic data and um, buying new computers, okay? What'll happen over time? in terms of your processing power related to your data? 
Yeah, so your data increases relative to your processing power exponentially, okay, right? So what are your, you have two options, okay? Either you can start spending exponentially more money on computers, okay? That actually becomes very expensive very quickly. Or um, you can come up with better m m algorithms to try to process the data, okay? So that's where, that's where there's a lot of opportunity. Okay, so um, there's many, okay, so there's many, many computational problems here. We're gonna be mostly working on genotype phenotype problems, which are um, design analysis of association studies, as we were talking about today, combining associations, integrating prior information, population structure. We're gonna be talking a lot about these different things. There's also lots of new technology problems as well, and there's also these kind of population genetics problems, which is, has to do with, um, in addition to the disease focus, we can try to say like human history and things like that, okay? So, um, okay, so that's, that's all I have for the, for the first part of the class. If uh, people have any questions, uh, now's a good time, and if, as soon as that, we can take a, we can take like a, a five minute break. So any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the website is uh, CCLE currently, but on CCLE there'll be a, another website where the videos are going to be, but it'll be an announcement in CCLE. Yeah. Are you about the, slides as well? the slides are already, for the first two lectures, are already on CCLE. Yeah, question? Yeah, any more questions? Yeah. How long do you think it'll take to get videos up? Uh, I mean, we're going to try to do them as quickly as possible. So um, hopefully we'll get them today, but, but, but just this week might be difficult, okay? Just because we're, you know, yeah. So we might post them to YouTube if we have to, just to make it faster, okay? But just don't share it, to, you know. Don't, don't use it to make fun of me or something like that, okay? Okay, any more questions? Okay, let's say we come back at... 3, 11.